We begin with a look at the Industrial Revolution in England, which began roughly around 1760. The Industrial Revolution was an earthquake of sorts. Just imagine the shock to the general populace. For centuries, energy had been generated by human hands and with the help of animals as they worked the land. People worked and lived on small farms and in villages scattered across the countryside. Water mills and windmills were the cutting edge of technology. Water and wind made things go. Then, all of a sudden, the amount of energy available to humans increased a hundredfold with the perfection of the steam engine by James Watt around 1780. This totally upended the way of life for millions of people. At the same time, the American Revolutionary War rolled on across the Atlantic. Catherine the Great, sat on the throne in Russia and ruled with an iron hand, and back in Europe, a 24-year-old composer by the name of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was composing his latest opera in Munich. Just a reminder, there were a lot of things going on around the world. Back in England, the shoemaker or bookmaker who had always served as both designer and production person now saw their handcrafts replaced by mass production with a clear division of labor between the designer and manufacturer. As productivity exploded and the centers of power shifted from the aristocratic landowning elite to the capitalist businessmen erecting new factories, people fled the countryside to seek higher wages in the new factory centers. Urban populations exploded. Men, women, and children worked under horrific conditions for long hours in filthy factories and under the eyes of brutal factory overseers. The workers and their families were crowded into disease-infested tenements under unsanitary conditions. Cholera was a constant threat to survival. These populations had to deal with regular cholera epidemics. The price of this industrial advancement was paid in human lives, truncated childhoods and broken families. Ironically, with the increase in mass-produced reading materials, literacy rates improved dramatically. A growing urban population with wages in their pockets and growing purchasing power demanded goods to buy. This encouraged the continued development of mass production, which in turn led to cheaper, more abundant merchandise. The standard of living actually began to improve throughout Europe and North America. As standards of living increased, critics of the new materiality, such as philosopher, writer, and painter John Ruskin, argued that people were getting seduced away from a focus on human values towards a preoccupation with cheap, shoddily produced material goods. In the area of typographic printing, design and production became separate components. The nature of visual communication now changed profoundly. A huge range of typographic styles and sizes became available. The 1800s became an inventive and prolific period of typeface design. Before the 19th century, the dominant function of typographic design had been the dissemination of information, primarily through books. Industrialization brought with it the need to produce, among other things, printed materials, advertising, and posters. In order to grab attention, bigger was now definitely better as communication moved from text-sized typefaces to broadsheet and poster-sized applications. Large scale and more ornate letter forms became important to garner attention and stand out. The alphabet, which previously functioned chiefly as phonetic symbols, was transformed into graphic elements. Letter forms became large at times abstract visual forms. The earliest evidence of large letter form production 
is traced to 1765, when Thomas Cotterell cast bold display letters that were larger than any previously seen, 12 pica high. 12 pica high type was about 2 inches in height. Remember that at this point, the size of metal type was limited in size by the ability to cast it. Sand casting was being used to produce oversized metal type, but even with this method, there were limits on size. In the area of design, Thomas Figgins introduced type in 1821 that we now classify as Egyptian. Speculation attributes the name of these typefaces to the early 19th century fascination with ancient Egyptian culture after Napoleon invaded Egypt and brought back samples of Egyptian art and sculpture, along with drawings of the vast and mysterious temples and inscriptions his army discovered there. Of course, how one discovers a culture that is thousands of years old makes little sense to our 21st century mindset. But to the average European, Egypt was the equivalent of the planet Mars. Also around this time, Clarendon typefaces were developed and were considered condensed forms of Egyptians with their stronger contrast between thick and thin strokes and somewhat lighter serifs. The Egyptian and Clarendon typefaces became what we know today as slab serif faces. These typefaces are recognized by their bold, machine-like feel and evenness of weight throughout the letter form some with little contrast between thick and thin strokes, and some slight diagonal stress. English type founders produced a huge variety of type designs. They modified forms and proportions and applied all kinds of decoration to their alphabets. Type was designed to show the illusion of three dimensions and all kinds of perspective variations were developed. In 1816, William Caslon IV designed the first sans serif font. Apparently based on the new Egyptian style of type, this typeface looked like Egyptian type with the serifs removed. Little notice was paid to the sans serif face, however, until the 1830s when a variety of foundries developed their own versions of the sans serif, each with a different name, Doric, Grotesque, Gothic. The name sans serif was coined in 1832 by Vincent Figgins. Throughout the 1800s, as large size type became more and more popular, problems such as weight and unevenness with casting large sizes became evident. A method was devised for the mass production of large size wood type, and the wood type poster became a popular 19th century form of visual communication. Traveling circuses, vaudeville houses, clothing stores, and railroads commonly used these big, bold posters to advertise their wares. Making the cutting of wood typefaces of different sizes much easier was the invention of the pantograph by William Leavenworth in 1834, which, when combined with the Wells router, formed the basic machinery required for making wood type on a production basis. If you visit the Hamilton Wood Type Museum in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, you can still see craftsmen cutting new wood type. At the beginning of the 19th century, the printing presses used were basically the same as the press, using movable metal type designed by Gutenberg over 350 years earlier. By the 1830s, the steam-powered press was in general use and the speed of production and sheet size of paper were greatly expanded and the cost of printing was drastically reduced. In 1886, an American, Otmar Mergenthaler, perfected a machine which set individual, even-spaced lines of type. Each linotype machine replaced seven to eight men and strikes and violence threatened many printing establishments. The linotype rapidly replaced handset type, however, and as a result, the proliferation of printed materials that ensued 
due to the linotype speed, aided in the establishment of thousands of new jobs in printing and related fields. Book publishing expanded rapidly and periodicals and weeklies flourished, leading to a golden age of magazine publishing. In 1887, Talbert Lanston invented the monotype, which cast single letters from hot metal. After the linotype and monotype were both in use, handset metal type faced a tremendous decline in usage. Efforts at stabilizing the metal type industry resulted in measures such as the 1892 merger of 14 different foundries. During the 19th century, as major innovations were occurring in the area of typography and printing, another major invention was paving the way for a process that would eventually replace the woodcut illustration or copper plate engraving. In France, in 1826, Joseph Niepce succeeded in producing the first crude photograph by using a classic camera obscura a setup for projecting images onto a surface and exposing a pewter sheet coated with light sensitive material to sunlight for one whole day. Further experimentation by a colleague, Louis Jacques Daguerre, after Niepce's death in 1833, led to his producing the first daguerreotype prints in 1839. Daguerre produced one of a kind images using silver-coated copper that was put through a process of polishing, sensitizing, and developing. In one of Daguerre's earliest images, he captured the human form for the first time, here in the street scene in Paris. As Daguerre was perfecting his image-making process in France, an Englishman, William Henry Fox Talbot, pioneered a process that became the basis for both modern photography and the process of photomechanical plate making and printing. In 1840, he invented the calotype process, whereby a negative was produced, therefore permitting the reproduction of an unlimited number of prints by projecting the negative image onto chemically treated light-sensitive paper. No more one-of-a-kind photographs. Through the 1800s, the photographic process evolved from the initial cumbersome procedure, and in 1888, George Eastman produced a camera which put photography into the hands of the general public. He called it the Kodak. The successful development of photography spurred exploration into its uses in the printing industry. In 1871, John Calvin Moss produced a commercially feasible photo engraving process in New York City. And in 1875, Charles Guillot opened the first photo relief printing firm in Paris. And in 1880, the first half-tone printed reproduction of an original photograph was printed by Stephen Horgan in New York City by projecting the image through a screen of dots. Any survey of groundbreaking photographers of the 19th century must include the following. David Octavius Hill, a Scottish painter who teamed up with Edinburgh photographer Robert Adamson to immortalize the 474 ministers who formed the Free Church of Scotland. The resulting calotypes were lauded as superior to Rembrandt's paintings. Julia Margaret Cameron, who specialized in portraiture. She received a camera and the equipment for processing collodion wet plates as a 49th birthday present and produced a series of photographic portraits that still impress by their artistry and ability to capture the individual personality. F.T. Nadar, a Frenchman whose portraits of writers, actors, and artists have a direct and dignified simplicity and provide an invaluable historical record. In 1886, the first photographic interview was published in Le Journal Illustré 
and included a series of 21 photographs when he interviewed the eminent 100-year-old scientist Michel Eugène Chevreul. Among his other subjects was the superstar of her age, Sarah Bernhardt, who was also portrayed famously by Alphonse Mucha, but more about him later on in the course. Matthew Brady and his assistants pioneered the area of photography known as reportage, probably better known today as photojournalism. Sent to the battlefields of the Civil War to record events photographically, Brady and a small army of assistants, including Alexander Gardner and Timothy H. O'Sullivan, spread out across the battlefields of the Civil War. The general public, for the first time, was presented with stark and realistic photos of the brutal carnage of battle. The impact on the public was immense and far greater than the wood engraved illustrations that had served previously. Edward Meyerbridge, an adventurous photographer commissioned by Leland Sanford to document his belief that a galloping horse lifted all four feet off the ground simultaneously. A $25,000 wager rested on the outcome. A battery of 24 cameras aimed at a galloping horse and equipped with rapid drop shutters produced a sequence of photographs arresting the horse's movement in time and space and paved the way for motion picture photography in the process. And yes, a horse does lift all four feet off the ground simultaneously in the middle of a gallop. During the age of Queen Victoria, who reigned for 64 years until her death in 1901, a fondness for the Gothic, which matched up well with the pious values of the Victorians, was promoted by the English architect A. W. N. Pugin, who designed the ornate details of the British Houses of Parliament. He had a philosophy that included the belief that the integrity and character of a civilization were linked to its design. The English designer, author, and authority on color, Owen Jones, became a major design influence at mid-century. Based on his travels to Spain and the Near East, he studied Islamic and Moorish ornamental design and introduced it to Western design in his books. In 1856, he published The Grammar of Ornament, filled with large color plates showcasing designs from a range of sources. Another landmark of design and culture was the Great Exhibition of 1851, conceived by Prince Albert, husband of Queen Victoria. Known more commonly as the Crystal Palace Exhibition, it showcased the products of 1,300 exhibitors from all the industrial nations. The wood type poster began its decline sometime around 1870 and was almost non existent by 1900 as the new process of lithographic printing surpassed the wood type process in efficiency and quality. Drawing directly with a grease-based crayon or pencil on a stone, whose surface was then chemically treated to reject ink on the open areas, artists and designers could reproduce in quantity any image that could be drawn. Stone printing is one of the oldest forms of printing images. Before that, when a book had an image, they were all drawn and painted by hand by monks. That was very time consuming. They invented etching so you could print pen drawings and in Japan they used woodblock prints to print images. But both of these methods were very graphical. Stone printing was invented by Alois Seinefelder. He experimented with an etching technique using a greasy acid resistant ink as a resist on a smooth grained limestone. In 1796 he found the solution and made his first planographic print. Planographic is printing from a flat surface. He perfected the technique and was now able to print sheet music. He also invented the first stone printing machine, the print from stone. Seinefelder wrote a book, 
Volstandiger Leerboek der Steindruckerei, which is still used by lithographers to this day. Lithography was perfected and later used by artists such as Toulouse-Lautrec and Pablo Picasso. It was a perfect way to reproducing posters in full color. Books were printed and a lot of other things. When offset printing was invented, stone lithography became a novelty and is now used by artists who want to make art in a direct way. So how does stone lithography work? You draw on a grinded limestone with a very smooth surface. You can sketch with a graphite pencil on the stone to set up your drawing. The graphite pencil won't be printed because it's not greasy. You have to protect the stone from your hands and fingers because they can be greasy and you'll otherwise end up with fingerprints on your artwork and you don't want that. So I made this sketch of an otter on the stone with a normal pencil. But you need a greasy pencil for the stone printing to work. You have five different pencils you can work with. One is the most greasy pencil and you can make very dark strokes with it. And number five is the most precise and subtle pencil you can use. I drew this picture with a number four. I used some different techniques just to try out how it would work out. I did some cross hatching and some gradients with little points. I also tried to make a smooth gradient with the greasy pencil, just to see how it would end up in print. When you're finished with your drawing, the stone is prepared with French chalk powder. This helps to protect it for the further process. The stone is then processed with a mixture of gum arabic and nitric acid. The gum separates the image area from the non-image areas. This is the etching of the stone. The drawing will receive the ink and will repel water. Usually you have to leave the stone for one day so the etching can take place on the surface of the stone. Then the stone is placed on the printing press. With turpentine oil the image will be washed off the stone. After that the stone is prepared with a thin layer of oily ink. By doing this, you remove the water-soluble gum edge. Now the stone is ready for print. The drawn image receives ink and the rest of the image receives water. Before printing, you have to keep the stone wet with water, so that the ink will not print the empty areas. On a piece of glass, you mix the ink and roll it with an ink roller. Before applying the ink onto the stone, the stone needs to be wet. You roll several times on the stone with the ink. Then you need to fan the stone so that the water dries. Then you can apply the paper onto the stone. On top of the paper a plate of leather is placed with a bit of ox gall. This helps the stone glide under the printing press. You move the stone under the press and then turn the lever to press down the paper onto the stone. With the turning wheel you move the stone and the paper under the press. Then you release the press with the lever. Then you remove the leather plate and carefully remove the paper from the stone. This is my first stone print I have made. For each print you have to repeat the same steps. Wetting the stone apply ink, fanning the stone, paper on the stone, and printing the stone onto the paper. Chromolithography involved the use of several stones, each printing a separate color, registered precisely with each pass of the paper being printed on, with combinations that resulted in eye-catching color posters. Chromolithography, patented in 1837, became especially popular between 1860 and 1890, 
sometimes with five or more, up to 20 colors, and was used in the production of art prints, posters, books, magazines, and product packaging. Among the best remembered practitioners of chromolithography was John H. Buford, the major innovator of chromolithography in Boston, whose crayon style images achieved a remarkable realism. Specializing in art prints, posters, covers, and book and magazine illustrations, he often used five or more colors, and the meticulous tonal drawing of his black stone always became the master plate. He produced the Swedish Song Quartet poster and the graphics for the posters of Grover Cleveland and Thomas A. Hendricks in the 1884 presidential campaign. Hallmarks of his designs were meticulous and convincing tonal drawings and the integration of image and lettering into a unified design. Louis Prang, a German immigrant to America whose work and influence were international in the Victorian era. His knowledge of printing, chemistry, color, business management, designing, engraving, and printing itself was of great value when he formed a chromolithography firm with Julius Meyer in 1856. In addition to creating art reproductions and Civil War maps and scenes, he produced literally millions of album cards printed with images of wildflowers, butterflies, children, animals, and birds called scrap. He has also been called the father of the American Christmas card for his pioneering work in holiday graphics. Unable to find high quality, non-toxic art materials for children, he began to manufacture and distribute watercolor sets and crayons. Finding a complete lack of competent educational materials for teaching industrial artists, fine artists, and children, he devoted tremendous energy to developing and publishing art instruction books. You can still buy Prang chalks and other materials, and you can still find affordable original Prang greeting cards on eBay. Now I return to the rise of American British publishing and the golden age of American illustration, usually considered to have taken place from 1890 to 1940. Leading the way in publishing were the Harper brothers, James, John, Wesley, and Fletcher. They established a printing firm in New York City in 1817, and by the mid-1800s had the largest printing and publishing company in the world. Even though by this time the halftone process had been introduced, full-color reproduction of photography was time-consuming and very expensive. Therefore, illustration was used because it was more economical to reproduce. Leading children's book illustrators of the day included Walter Crane, one of the earliest and most influential designers of children's picture books. Apprenticed as a wood engraver as a teenager, he was 20 years old in 1865 when his Railroad Alphabet was published. A long series of his toy books broke with the traditions of printed material for children and sought only to entertain. He drew inspiration from the flat color and flowing contours of Japanese wood block prints and was the first to introduce them into Western art. Kate Greenaway. Her expressions of the childhood experience captured the imagination of the Victorian era. As a poet and illustrator, she created a modest, small world of childhood happiness. As a book designer, she sometimes pushed her graceful sense of page layout to innovative levels. The clothes she designed for her models had a major influence on children's fashion design, and she became a renowned graphic artist whose books are still in print. Randolph Caldecott. In the United States, receiving the Randolph Caldecott Medal is the highest honor an artist can achieve for children's book illustration. Among the other best-known illustrators of the time were Thomas Nast, one of the first and greatest political cartoonists. He famously took on Boss Tweed and the corrupt Tammany Hall politicians and mercilessly ridiculed and exposed them. The graphic symbols he popularized and focused on include a number of important images. 
Santa Claus, John Bull as a symbol of England, the Democratic Donkey, the Republican Elephant, Uncle Sam, and Columbia, a symbolic female signifying democracy that became a prototype for the Statue of Liberty. Charles Dana Gibson. His images of young women and square-jawed men established a model of physical beauty in the mass media that endured for decades. His illustrations of women were dubbed the Gibson Girls. And Howard Pyle. His own work and remarkable gifts as a teacher made him the major force that launched the period called the Golden Age of American Illustration. He published over 3,300 illustrations and 200 texts, ranging from simple children's fables to his monumental four-volume, The Story of King Arthur and His Knights. The meticulous research, elaborate staging, and historical accuracy of his work inspired a younger generation of graphic artists to carry forward the tradition of realism in America. He was 23 years old when he received his first illustration commission from Scribner's Monthly in 1876 and developed his style with the advances in photographic printing and the four color process system. Next time, we will take a look at the rise of the arts and crafts movement led by William Morris and others as a reaction to the mass production of the Industrial Revolution.